Okay, I'm going to gavel our meeting to order here. Uh, my name is Paul Sethi. I am going to preside over the meeting for our board of directors this evening. President John Weed is in Washington, D.C., um, tending to some water affairs. And uh, Director Akbari is also going to uh, participate remotely. So um, this is our regular monthly board meeting on July 14th. It's uh, 6 p.m. And I'm going to turn over some preliminaries to the general manager. Sure thing. Thank you, Vice President Sethi. Just for the record, um, both uh, Director Akbari and President Weed are participating virtually this evening and are on Zoom. So my name is Ed Stevenson. I serve as the district's general manager. Members of the public may participate in this board meeting in person or remotely by either using the Zoom application or by telephone. Any member of the public participating in person may approach the speaker's podium at the appropriate time. For those participating remotely, note that the meeting agenda, staff reports, and presentation materials are all available on the district's website at acwd.org. You may reference the instructions at the top of the agenda for how to participate using the controls in the Zoom application or your dial pad if participating by telephone audio. This board meeting is being recorded and will be made available to the public for future viewing. Thank you, and that completes my housekeeping remarks. Would the secretary please take the roll? Yes, Director Sethi. Here. Akbari. Here via Zoom. Gunther. Here. Wong. Here. And Weed. Here via Zoom. So, um, Director Gunther, would you lead us in the slurping flag, please? Would you lead us in the slurping flag? At this time, uh, we will take public comments, either in the boardroom or remotely. Members of the public may address the board on any issues not listed on the agenda, which are within the purview of the Alameda County Water District. The five minute limit is customary. However, the board president, in, case my, in this case myself, may adjust the actual time allotted to accommodate the number of speakers. Members of the public who wish to address the board on a scheduled item will be given the opportunity to do so when it comes up. Seeing nobody in the boardroom, do we have anybody via Zoom that would like to speak? And I am seeing no members of the public in our Zoom attendees list. Okay. Did we have any written communications that need to be reported? No. Okay. So we'll move on to the consent calendar. I would uh, invite an invitation from the board for a motion. I will move items 51, 52, 53, and 54 to a consent calendar, please. Second. I would request that item five four. Uh, I'd like I have some comments on item five four. All right, then I will amend my motion to only add items five one, five two, and five three to the consent calendar, please. And I will second that one. Director Sethi? Yes. Akbari? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Wong? Aye. And Weed? Aye. I'll move this consent calendar as amended. I'll second. Director Sethi? Aye. Akbari? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Wong? Aye. And Weed? Aye. On. At this time, we'll take up item 5.4. Uh, Director Weed, do you need to recuse yourself? No. Um, my minor comments related to. Uh, to the item itself and uh, requesting that it be reviewed in our next rate hearing and, and discussion. Item, and let me, uh, I'm supporting the uh, staff recommendation, but this is a tax issue where um, we put on the property tax bill. We put two thirds of the charge approximately on the property tax bill, and then put the one third uh, ratepayers covered. 
Zone 7 uh, and Valley Water are the other two districts that are involved with the South Bay Aqueduct um, cost uh, support. Zone 7 puts 80% of the bill on the property tax. And Valley Water District puts 100% of the spill on the property tax. It's uh, two to three million dollars, as I recall. And it's items that I believe should be paid through the property tax rather than put on the back of our, of our rate payers. It really is a property tax related item as paying for the operation of the uh, of, the, of this facility, the state, uh, the state facility. So during the rate hearings, I would ask that we may mention this as one of the items that may have to go into a Prop 218 uh, notice if we were to change it, but it's one of the steps in trying to get our um, accounting, in my mind, properly aligned. Thank you. Well, thank you for your comments, President Weed. Uh, I second your thought about revisiting this. I think it's been four or five years since we reviewed this in the finance committee, um, but I am open to um, taking another look at that subject. It predates so, myself and Jim Gunther. So it's been on the books probably for 50 plus years at this ratio. And I think it needs to be reviewed and I feel in my mind raised to 100%. So would somebody like to make a motion on this item? I'll make a motion. I'll second. Director Sethi? Yes. Akbari? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Wong? Aye. And Weed? Aye. Okay, we'll move on to uh, item 5.5 .5 on the action calendar, resolution approving FY 2022-2023 consolidated salary schedule and related salary schedules. All right, thank you, Vice President Sethi. And this item will be covered by our Director of Finance and Administration, Mr. John Wunderlich. Great, thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Good evening, members of the board and public. Uh, the board of directors is required to adopt a resolution approving the fiscal year 2022-23 salary schedule that lists the base pay for all district job classifications. Additionally, because the consolidated salary schedule lists the general manager's and department director's salary ranges, an oral report that summarizes the recommendation is legally required before the board takes action to approve it. The attached consolidated salary schedule is consistent with labor negotiations concluded in 2021 and includes a 3.25% cost of living adjustment for most classifications. The general manager classification was not subject to those negotiations and is not receiving a COLA. For employees and classifications paid above market per the classification and compensation study conducted by the district last year, their salaries were frozen and they will not receive a COLA until their new salary range catches up to the prior salary range. For fiscal year 22-23, they will receive the previously approved lump sum payment in lieu of a COLA. Approval of this item will help the district achieve a strategic plan goal 3.3, promote financial transparency. So the recommendation here is by motion, adopt a resolution approving and adopting the attached fiscal year 2022-23 consolidated salary schedule and two related salary schedules as described in the board packet on this item. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the board? I don't see any public, anybody via Zoom that would like to raise an issue. Either Director Weed or President Weed, Director Akbari. No, no questions from my end, thank you. And again, I don't see anyone uh, attending our Zoom meeting as a member of the public. Um, I'll go forward and make the resolution approving the staff recommendation. I'll, I'll second. Directors Sethi? Aye. Ekbari? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Wong? Aye. And Weed? Aye. 
Okay, we move on to reports. Um, would anybody like to make a comment on any of the board committee reports? Um, I do. I would like to make some comments regarding the uh, recent operations and water quality meeting that we had um, on, on June 7th. Oh, I'm sorry, earlier this month in July, actually, the most recent meeting with uh, Director Gunther and I participating. Um, and Mr. Wonderlick was sitting in for uh, Mr. Stevenson at the time. So I just wanted to note that it was four years ago that um, the head of operations, uh, Steve Peterson, and I sat down to take a look at what the uh, energy expenses were as part of our operating budget. And along with help from finance, we identified that around 5% of all of our operational expenses were uh, in the area of energy usage and the cost of energy is going up year by year. So I propose that the time that we have a set of workshops to take a look at all areas of the district where we could become more energy efficient. And uh, <clears throat> I just wanna note how, how hard the board worked through several workshops and in terms of whittling down to things that we thought would be uh, uh, helpful to our district where we could create cost savings for our ratepayers, And even if we could reduce that 5% down to 4% or 3%, when you have a $100 million operating budget, it adds up to a lot of money. So uh, it's taken us four years now uh, to even get to where we can dig some shovels in the ground for our initial solar project. Uh, and we will have, according to the city of Fremont and others in the county, one of the largest uh, solar installations in the county as an organization or a private entity. And we will be approximately 20% of all the solar generation for the city of Fremont from what we've heard, which is really kind of astounding. Um, second, a lot of these other things have taken four years to accomplish, including the most recent um, uh, lighting upgrade across the district, which is, was reviewed in the July uh, meeting. And so we were cracking some old Polish jokes about <laughs> how long it takes to uh, screw in a light bulb. Um, but I'm very delighted that, uh, you know, when you have a vision for something, it's important that people carry through on that vision. And uh, as board members, we have to stay on top of these things until they actually do get done. And then when they're finally achieved, there is a sense of real accomplishment. And I, I feel like when I spearheaded this four years ago, that I can now look back and say today, yes, uh, we accomplished something very important for our community. That's all I wanted to know. Any other comments on my comments or on other Meeting reports. I just wish it wouldn't take so long. Yeah. It was an interesting meeting, I'll say that. And some very enlightening information on how long something could take. Yes. And I won't tell any of the more saucier jokes that were told. <laughs> okay. We'll move on to operational reports. Do we have any directors that would like to make comment? I'll also just note for the board that we did have a member of the public join us, Mr. Ken Nishimura. Welcome, Mr. Nishimura. Any comments on operational reports? Any comments on the distribution system monthly hardness map? Still uh, looking fairly good. Oh, yeah. um, 
I would actually like if staff could comment on this for the board because I requested in the committee meeting that we're making changes to how our distribution hardness report is uh, published in our uh, board materials. And uh, I think it's important for the public to understand the changes. Sure, yeah, we're planning on doing a little bit more of a review next month where we can show the board where we're headed, but I'd be happy to ask Mr. Ahrens to give a brief overview. Yeah, staff has been looking at ways to basically reduce the work effort in preparing some of these maps. Um, they come to the board once a month, but they're prepared weekly by staff or other report and discussion purposes. Um, but that require, requires some reformatting of it. So it was discussed at the committee and the committee has some questions and concerns and asked that it come to the full board for discussion as well. So next month, I'll be including two versions of the map. Um, so we can kind of do a side-by-side -side comparison they're very similar, but there's a few subtle differences that uh, we want to point out and, and answer any questions or hear any concerns you might have. So next month's board packet will include two hopefully close to identical versions of the hardness map. Okay, great. We look forward to that uh, update. And Mr. Nishimura, you're welcome to make any comments. Yes, uh, thank you. I, actually, I was in attendance at that committee meeting where I did get to uh, review the proposed changes, and I wholeheartedly support that. Uh, I think the the changes are are relatively minimal, and, and if it saves staff time, I I, I fully support it. So uh, I look forward to uh, getting the same information with less staff time invested. Uh, and again, uh, I I concur with Director Gunther. You know, it's the hardness is looking good. It'd be you know again better if we could get it lower, but uh, given the, the situation we have uh, with, with with the drought, uh, you know, I think we're, we're below 150 district-wide, and, and I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nishimura. Okay, we'll move on to item 6.3, uh, staff presentations, where I see we have none. Correct. Um, so we'll move on to Item 6.4, the general manager's reports. Okay, so starting off with 6.4.1, update on COVID-19. I'll keep this very brief. I think the board is very, very familiar with where we are in COVID, but you know, this is a time, it's a trying time. There's a, a lot going on in terms of positive case counts in the community around us. The good news is it seems to be plateauing and dropping a bit, but you can never really tell where it's going to go in the future. We've definitely seen improvement here in terms of number of employees that have been impacted. Um, you know, in my last report, I think we had seven employees that were out isolating or quarantining. Now we have four. Um, so there's a little bit less in the way of operational impacts and so forth that goes along with that. However, you know, we're not taking anything for granted. We continue with the same protocols that we've uh, had. We're masking indoors here at the headquarters facility. We're masking or distancing um, outdoors. We are continuing with our uh, weekly mandatory testing for everybody here on the H uh, headquarters facility site and everybody who's uh, unvaccinated, regardless of what site you're at. Um, and so we're continuing to con uh, suspend our in office work requirements for folks in the telecommuting program, but we're reevaluating that routinely. At, at this point, we're targeting coming back in August. But, you know, there's a lot that changes week to week with COVID. And so we're keeping a close eye on that. Um, so I feel like we're in a period of flux, but we expect that uh, even if things calm down uh, with this current uh, variant and spike that we've seen, we got to expect that there will be more. And there's been something in the late summer, early fall in every year of this pandemic. So we're trying to be prepared for that when that happens. Um, but uh, overall, things looking much better than they did uh, at this time last month but uh, we're still continuing to be careful. Uh, any questions on our COVID-19 response or situation? No. Okay, and seeing nothing from Director Weed or Akbari. No. Okay, so we have another uh, general manager's report. Uh, it's our drought update for this month and I'll turn it over to our Director of Water Resources, Laura Haidas. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. So just a few quick updates tonight. Um, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of water supply updates, we really don't have any updates uh, on new information this month. Uh, San Francisco PUC and the Department of, water of Re Department of Water Resources remain at the same allocations as uh, we talked about last month. 
and local supplies groundwater levels do trend similar to where they were last year at this time. So next slide, please. On the statewide level, they, the um, State Water Resources Control Board did um, put in the emergency regulations, put in, they went into effect June 10th of last month. There's a couple of key differences we wanted to highlight for the board um, in what's in those emergency regulations uh, compared to the district's ordinance number 2021-01. And those two differences include that the emergency regulations have a ban on irrigation of non-functional turf in non-residential sites. And that does include homeowners association common areas. Uh, the requirement for utilities is to communicate to customers. Enforcement is not required. Um, but staff does plan to work with our customers to address this issue. Um, we are going to be communicating and reaching out to everybody to let them know. And we will be um, working with customers and, and uh, that we receive complaints on this and any ongoing violations, which we really don't expect because generally we have a, a good uh, process with our customers that gets them to comply, which is really the goal. Um, but anybody with ongoing violations would be referred to the state for enforcement. The uh, emergency regulations also include a recommendation to translate drought restrictions and materials to additional languages to ensure that in disadvantaged communities have access to the, this information. Um, so this is not a requirement, but the district is evaluating commonly spoken languages and will continue to provide information to all customers. Um, so given that these really won't impact the way we're doing things right now, um, and they're not significantly different than the ordinance, we're not recommending any changes right now to the existing ordinance at this time. Next slide, please. So to give you an update on how we are doing, uh, you can see this is our monthly graph that we share with the purple line, purple dashed line being our target that we're trying to achieve over the course of the year for our 15% annual goal reductions. The orange line, which you can see really peaks during the summer months, is the 2020 uh, water demand. And the blue line, which you can see uh, inching its way up through June, is the current year. And so as of June, uh, you can see we are still a little bit above our purple target, uh, but we were at a 13% reduction as compared to June 2020. And uh, late breaking news, we, we of course won't have the July numbers until the end of the month, but so far it's looking like things are really trending downward and we're gonna be below our purple target for the month, ranging so far in the area of 15 to 20% uh, below where we were in 2020 during July. So that's hopefully some good news that our customers are hearing the message and responding. So we'll be continuing to watch that really closely as the month progresses and the summer progresses um, to see how things go during this irrigation system. Irrigation season, not system. <laughs> Thanks. Um, next slide, please. And water use efficiency activity remains high. Um, you can see the very tall bar in June indicates that we've gotten a lot of water waste reports um, and a lot of calls and emails to our hotline. Um, July so far was a little less busy during the first week of the month, but given holidays, but we have definitely seen a, an uptick back to sort of the steady stream of calls. And we have gotten about one call per day specific to questions about the non-functional turf issue. Next slide, please. And some outreach highlights. A um, couple of major things have been happening. Uh, there was a severe drought, please save water postcard that all of our customers received actually this week. You could see a picture of that, the front of that postcard on the right with the bright red uh, header there to catch people's attention. Uh, a severe drought advisory was also sent via the rapid alert emergency notification system late in June. And that definitely got customers attention um, with a lot of folks calling. and. We've been developing materials to communicate the ban on non-functional turf. We'll be having the ACWD Aqueduct Drought Edition um, coming out, and that is the second issue that's been de dedicated entirely to drought. Uh, we have partnered with the school districts to email drought flyers to parents, 19,150 of them going out to parents electronically. 
And then a variety of digital advertisements have been happening in the Indian po India Post, Google, and Facebook. And the acwd.org drought slash drought webpage has been updated. So you'll see there, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for, uh, for our customers to find the information they're looking for. And then just a couple of in-person community outreach highlights, Fremont 4th of July parade um, occurred recently. We saw many of you there. And the Festival of India Mela is occurring August 20th through 21st, and we'll be participating in that as well. Uh, so, and these are just highlights of the outreach that's been happening over the past month or so. There's a lot more information in the white infinity <laughs> packet that you're welcome to peruse as well, but we wanted to share these highlights for the month. Next slide, please. And I think with that, that's all I have. And I'm happy to answer questions. On the right, you just see a little snip from what our new drought um, web page looks like with some quick links with icons to make it nice and easy for people to use. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Uh, Director Weed or uh, Akbari? Well, I'd like, um, Director Weed, I'd like to thank the staff for the report. Uh, director Akbari, did you have a, is there another director has a comment or question? Mine is a comment. So if there's a question, please proceed. No, none for me. Thank you. <laughs> okay. The comment is, I've, I, we're doing good work. We're following the state mandates. Let me give one of the ironies I, I encountered recently. The city of Santa Cruz has been granted an exemption from the uh, state ordered mandates. I brought it to the attention of Bosk and they came back and said there were three criteria that the city of Santa Cruz met. They were not part of the state or federal water system. They um, were um, they were meeting the conservation goals of the state of 45 uh, gallons per day per person. And they had a water supply through the reservoir that was um, secured through September of next year. What I found ironic is that the city and county of San Francisco is an individual district independent and a number of members of Bosca which relies solely on San Francisco, would also qualify for that exemption. We're not doing it. San Francisco is following along and requesting the, um, and, uh, the, the mandates and the reductions. But it, I found it interesting how this applies. I was at, uh, had the opportunity to go up to Hetch Hetchy about two weeks ago. And that reservoir is filled to the brim. Now, Don Pedro is a little bit less. But San Francisco has water and water reserves. It's remarkable. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a, a quick comment. First, uh, I communicated to the staff here um, about how excellent I thought the uh, then and now photo postcard was. Um, and I especially like the education on the back of the card where you inform people that this creek is responsible for 40% of our water supply. And so I think it was a very effective messaging that was put out to the community. And I could really feel the alarm bell go off when, when I read through it. I did receive the RANS uh, call uh, one morning. And uh, I also wanted to compliment the staff on the outreach in terms of partnering with our school districts. That is really another very effective means of not only educating young people in the community um, at different grade levels, because they have a responsibility as well as their parents. Uh, but that is a tremendous effort and I uh, applaud the staff for what they did. Thank you, I'll pass that on to the team. Okay, if there are no other any comments from the public? Raise your hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Trying to get my hand up. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. No. Uh, I, I am. I'm actually uh, pleased to hear that we're actually trending closer to our 15% line. In fact, uh, with the 13%, I think adjusting for the growth that the 
the district has had in terms of, uh, of connections between 2020 and 2022, um, you know, I think on a, per, on a per connection basis, we are probably are approaching 15%, even, even for the month of June. And, and as Ms. Hyde has said, uh, we may actually exceed uh, the goal in, in July, which is, 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 is great news. Um, so, uh, and, and yes, I did receive that postcard and, and, uh, you know, it was, it, it's, it, I think it's a good message and I encourage, uh, the district to keep up their efforts, um, uh, because, uh, you know, if we don't meet, <laughs> if we don't meet our goals, I think the state will rightfully or wrongfully will come in, uh, and, and impose more draconian, uh, uh restrictions on us. And I think that's, uh, I think it's in everybody's interest to, uh, try to keep that from happening. Thank you very much. Um, before I go to President Weed, uh, I know we have uh, Mr. Abreu as a member of the public here too. Um, have, would you have any comments, Mr. Abreu? Well, uh, since you since you asked, um, I'll just note that uh, East Bay Mud was saying that they that this month in the first week or two of this month they were at nineteen percent conservation, which is just like almost the same as what uh, what what uh, ACWD is talking about. But as of the last official reporting period, which was uh, May, through the month of May, uh, all the agencies, the SFPC, the Ace Bay Mud, all three, and the ACWD, all three agencies were somewhere hovering around, cumulative around 7%. So, so uh, you know, the, these, these numbers of, uh, are, are very weather dependent. And I, you know, it'd be nice to, uh, if we're gonna have all this modeling stuff, why don't we could have, why not to have some weather adjusted modeling? We can tell us, you know, adjusting for all the cold or hot weather we're having lately, whatever it is, then uh, are we actually, uh, uh, you know, at 19% or whatever, or 15%, whatever the number is, or are we just uh, having weather variations? Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Uh, President Weed, do you have some additional comments? Yes, uh, please. Um, first of all, I think it's helpful for all, all of us to keep in, uh, in context what is going on. This Bolton Industrial is 9% of the state's water supply. A 20% reduction is less than 2% of the total state water. So we're going through. Um, some interesting um, procedures and some almost draconian in some cases, efforts to chase 2% of the state's water supply. The second aspect to it came to my attention and apparently it was in, it came Somebody out- Somebody is uh, making a lot of noise in the background and people need to mute themselves. Thank you. Yeah, John, I, <clears throat> President Weed, I think that might be coming from your side, maybe some scraping around of papers or something. So just- uh, Is that right? I, as a heads up. Okay. I, I'll try and keep it. Uh, the um, second, there was a newspaper article as of yesterday, I believe, on Sylvester Stallone in Southern California um, not meeting the requirements and being well over, and some other celebrities. It was pointed out to me at this conference that when you do take action against and uh, file a uh, an action against an individual um, customer the confidentiality is lost. That becomes a matter of public record, including the uh, account and individual. And that's how the press got involved and started reporting individual names. In the last route, we had no enforcement actions. We had 100% compliance and that was wonderful. And I suspect we'll have the same. But I found one of the, again, uh, one of the interesting aspects was that you lose confidentiality if a, um, the, the customer loses confidentiality in a case where a district takes an action um, and finds the person in violation of the guidelines in their emergency order. So thank you. Okay. That's our drought update. Any other reports? One other brief uh, general manager's report from Kurt Arenz, our director of operations and maintenance. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Um, just want to revisit, if you remember earlier this year, we participated in the best tasting water contest at the AWWA California Nevada conference. 
And through some um, events that occurred, we were also we didn't win that contest, but we were invited to participate at the national conference. So early in June, uh, the district did participate in the best of the best tasting tap water con competition at the national conference. There were 25 agencies from across the country participating. Uh, the judges prejudged before the, the final tasting. And I'm pleased to say that ACWD was in the top five of the competition. So we made the top five best tasting waters in the nation. Fortunately, we did not win, but I still think the fact we made top five really comparing against, you know, 25 other agencies says a lot for the quality of the water we produce. So it was a good showing and hopefully we can only move up from here. So <laughs> I just want to report that. Thank you. Thank you very much for that update. And second. that completes our general manager's report. Okay. I, I, I'm pretty sure we were a very, very close second, although they didn't rank those top five, but I'm, I'm sure we were right in there. I think I saw a district up in Alaska that was like. <laughs> yeah, Sitka, Alaska, I think came in second. Yeah, well, they're awesome. getting their water right off the glacier. Yeah, that's not fair. <laughs> so we had some stiff competition, yeah. Okay, we'll move to item seven on the agenda. Oh, oh uh, sorry, Vice President Sethi, we do have a hand, hand oh. up from Mr. Brew. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll I'll uh, defer to the tasting experts on the on the tasting of the of of the water. If it tasted bad, I would tell you. So that's that's my my take on it. But the uh, uh, the I'm wondering what what temperature they taste the they put the water at. What's the best temperature to be drinking water? Just just a little little question. Thanks. I believe the competition was done at room temperature. It was not chilled. It was left out at room temperature. Whatever that was for the conference is hard to say. But. Is there any PR that we can get out of this? Maybe. Might be good uh, to report this out to the community. Potentially. There might, there, there might be. We'll look for an opportunity. Okay. Uh, we don't, we've got lots of other messaging. We want to make sure it takes top billing, yeah. but uh, this wouldn't hurt to get out there. Yeah. It could be in the Drought, uh, the drought newsletter. Oh, by the way. <laughs> okay, item number seven, director's comments, reports on meetings attended and agenda item requests. So I'm first here and I would ask to defer my report until next month because I was, it was a very good conference, but I'm awaiting the presentation materials that were given out and I would like to distribute some uh, high impact slides to the board and staff. So I'll defer on that presentation. I do have three other very short reports, but I'd like to go to Director Weed first to have him report on the conference that he's currently attending. We also had the Shasta uh, visit and there was some information. I'm currently at the Aqua East Conference. We used to call it 10 Cup Week coming to Washington, DC. And in this case, the ability to walk through the halls of Congress has been severely curtailed. You can only get into Congress if you have a uh, scheduled meeting with someone and they come down and, and escort you up. Um, so a few people did go through that uh, venture. Most did not. We stayed at the uh, Mayflower Hotel for the conference. Two items for... Um, I found interesting. One related to Shasta and earlier Shasta report. It was noted that we now, that because of the warm water in Shasta, they have brought in six large refrigerated trailers, truck trailers, to cool the water being released from Shasta to support the fish. No report on what the cost or the energy. Uh, uh, pre President, President Weed, sorry to interrupt, but. Um, you're creating some kind of noise in the background that is drowning out what you're saying. I'm surprised at that because I'm speaking a fairly quiet area right now. Do you still hear the noise in the background? It sounds like shuffling of paper or something. Hmm. Or he's, uh, somebody else's. People need to mute themselves for practical purposes here in the meeting. Yeah, at this time, everyone is muted except Director Weed and the boardroom. All right, so somehow in this communication that we have from the hotel is, uh, is a challenge. So I'll try and speak uh, briefly then. 
the cooling of water released from the dam, mechanical cooling, strikes me as a remarkable step. We, we used to joke about putting truckloads of ice cubes into the creek at the, regardless of cost. And we're, apparently we've reached that point. Um, next, the EPA director spoke to the conference and said that they were promoting, and he was promoting and pushing for an exemption of the BABA, the Build American Better rules for projects that were already in the works. And that's where we, um, as funding the state revolving fund, where we have bailed because of those BABA regulations. Um, it's unfortunate, but it, I encourage us to follow up and see at some point if we can, if there is, might be an opportunity to get a, an advantage of an exemption of the BABA uh, requirements. The, um, I had a presentation from John Watts on this uh, Stream Act by Feinstein. And there, a definition of economically disadvantaged communities was important. They're using an IRS code and there should be fine certain tracks, that, uh, census tracks that meet that IRS code. I've asked them for that information if we can get it to see if it helps us at all. I would think that it will help certain part districts immensely. The, currently the federal government is directing that 40% of the federal funds to states go to economically disadvantaged communities on all of their programs. So that's a, a general number and why it's so important to identify who's economically disadvantaged. Um, those are the key points at this point. Thank you. Okay, I had three um, short items here, <clears throat> or four. First of all, uh, a three, okay. So yesterday, um, Mr. Wonderlick and I participated in the monthly uh, LVE JPA board meeting. And I just wanted to report that everything on that program is moving forward smoothly. Everything is to schedule and we've only had one uh, surprise cost variance uh, that we had to approve yesterday that was uh, on a bid that came in um, over the expected engineer's uh, estimate. So uh, I think we have really good news there about everything really meeting the schedule and everybody, all eight districts that are on the represented on the board are working well together. Our uh, committee meetings have gotten off the ground really well, and all of our necessary legal and policy documents, um, I think we've worked on all of those pretty, uh, pretty nicely. There's um, one piece of news, which is that uh, we're eager to select a, an executive director uh, like we have for the Delta Conveyance Project. So uh, they put out a, so a solicitation um, and uh, we have a recruiter who narrowed that down to the eight top responsive um, candidates. Um, we had a subcommittee of the board president, Angela Ramirez Holmes from zone seven, uh, Steve Ritchie from San Francisco, and uh, one other person that uh, interviewed the, the final four and made a recommendation of two. So next month, the board, in addition to its regular monthly board meeting, will have a closed door session where we can interview the two final candidates. Hopefully that person is on board in September. And concurrently, um, and very importantly, we are trying to um, put out a solicitation for uh, a program manager and we went through an evaluation of all different types of program management um, models that are used in, in the business world. And we selected uh, an integrated team program management approach. Uh, there's a very specific definition of what that means. And so, uh, this is a critical function reporting to the executive director 
and uh, responsible to the board. So we should be making good progress on that moving into the fall as well. So that's my report on LVE. Uh, number two, uh, I was at the um, Alameda County uh, Special Districts Association meeting on Monday. This meeting is every two months. And uh, uh, we have not met in person since January of 2020 because our March meeting was canceled due to the COVID shutdown. And we had a very nice uh, dinner, as we always do in May, uh, planned at the Castro Valley um, Golf Course. Really beautiful. And uh, unfortunately, we couldn't have that dinner. So each of you has a gift in front of you, which was supposed to be distributed at the May dinner for the 30-year anniversary of, of our special districts association. It's a paperweight. If you don't want it, you can always give it to somebody on staff. And I've left one here for Director Weed and Director Akbari as well. Um, so uh, we finally got those out. We had only half as many people that had signed up. This was a joint meeting of that we have annually between the Alameda County and the Contra Costa County. Um, special districts. So it only happens once a year. But only half of the people that signed up for coming uh, came because reportedly too many people were just really down under the weather. Um, we had two excellent presentations. Or three, three. And the first I'd like to report on, uh, and maybe President Weed is familiar with this being back in Washington, D.C., but the legislative um, analyst for CSDA gave us a report on a number of important bills. Uh, there was one that really stood out to me, which is H.R. 7242. It's the Community Disaster Re Resilience Zones Act of 2022. And this is... Um, a special bill that builds on the community disaster resili resilience money that's already been approved and appropriated um, in previous years. But this one is specifically targeting areas that are of the highest uh, exposure to natural disaster hazards. And so all of us that are on the Hayward Fault, all special districts on the Hayward Fault, were encouraged in both counties to please write letters to our congressional representatives. So I'm hoping that working with uh, our um, with our lobbyists up in San Francisco, we can put together uh, a letter of support here. Right. I, I could. I can't see any reason why we would not want to do this, because this would allow us uh, extra federal money for uh, preparing for that earthquake. So we can actually put in storage of materials and buy things now uh, for that future event when it does occur. So it's working its way through Congress right now. And uh, um, let's see if we can put some pressure on the right people. Uh, we had two uh, excellent presentations, one from um, the uh, president of the BART board on all of the uh, um, developments around BART. And uh, I asked some critical questions of my friend, Rebecca Saltzman, the board president. And I, I gave her a little bit of forewarning because the Sunday editorial in the East Bay newspapers was um, especially critical of BART and they had to have special legislation passed um, a couple of years ago to enforce the rules on an independent uh, inspector general and that BART is not living up to 
um, uh, what the public is expecting. They went through a grand jury investigation where the grand jury came back with a, an extremely critical report on the entire organization. That's what led to uh, legislation being passed in Sacramento to really crack down on BART. And uh, nevertheless, she gave a, a, an excellent presentation. There's a lot of um, forward-looking thought in BART right now as to where we go over the next uh, 40, 50 years. And so she was laying out uh, a lot of those plans. The last presentation was made by um, uh, East Bay Director Frank Mellon, who is going to retire in November after his 28th year of service on the board. And he still appears to be a young man <laughs> um, and very uh, vibrant, you know, active. And so he gave an update on everything that uh, East Bay Mud is doing in terms of water conservation and development of new water supplies. And uh, their partnerships with different entities. He gave a very interesting presentation, which uh, I would like to follow up here with a request to staff. He went through uh, presenting on the leak detection devices that they have put on fire hydrants in the district. And they did this as a, um, uh, kind of for field testing, expanded it as a pilot program, and they have determined that they had a complete financial recovery within three years based on the investment that they made. So when I came back home, I decided to research what is going on in this field because I see it at the aqua conferences that we attend. Uh, you know, when they when the vendors are presenting on their different products and everything. And uh, come to find out that San Francisco installed 158 um, smart fire hydrants. These are not the leak detection devices. These are smart fire hydrants. Or a hundred square blocks in one part of San Francisco and then um, 200 blocks in another part of San Francisco. And they were able to detect uh, major leaks underground that they were not even aware of, which were significant uh, losses, of, losses of water, uh, not only on a daily basis, but an hourly basis. So they also report that they have uh, gotten a very quick payback on this technology. And now they are rotating these smart um, fire hydrants around San Francisco to other areas. Uh, so once you've detected the leaks, you can then replace it with a, um, a standard uh, fire hydrant and, uh, and then remobilize these uh, smart fire hydrants. And um, San Jose Water Company has also deployed the um, leak detection devices, which are a cap on top of the fire hydrants. But I found quite a few water districts are, are now kind of in the early stages of evaluating these technologies. Um, they're all reporting back the, the early payback. And so, uh, I would like to close with the request to staff that we actually do a study on the different technologies uh, that we might deploy uh, in our service area. Uh, first, evaluate you know the different technologies that are out there. Two, study uh, what other water districts are doing and interview people that are. Um, uh, doing this actual work. And three, let's figure out what um, future deployment might look like for ACWD and what the payback period would be on doing a cost-benefit analysis. 
I think this might be a good project for someone in the district, uh, especially on our facility side. Yeah, and, and uh, Vice President Sethi, I can just uh, add that the district has um, done a fair amount of evaluation of the different systems available. Um, and uh, a few months ago, we began our own program and we did uh, deploy uh, a number of these. We're, we're deploying more and more each year under a sort of a scheduled rollout. Uh, and so we do have uh, many of those devices. It's the, it's the uh, leak detection device that you add to the hydrant. And we have quite a number out there and then more coming and also a sort of monitoring program that goes along with that. And so we're, we're looking forward to being able to come back to the board and share the results of the program that we've already begun. So this would come under future agenda item requests. Sure. Yeah. I would be more than happy to submit that request Got on it. this subject. Got it. Yep. Uh, I would I would be delighted to learn more about what we're doing. And it's nice to see that we're uh, rolling with the tide here with the other districts. But uh, all in all, it was a, an excellent update uh, from uh, East Bay Mud. And I think it might be appropriate later on in the year because Frank has been one of those really good friends in the water industry that's uh, always been jointly supportive of us. And uh, he's just a remarkable person, you know, when it comes to his water knowledge. You would never guess he's a director on the board because he sounds like he's the CEO. <laughs> um, but uh, maybe we can consider that later in the year, uh, some kind of letter of appreciation. So that concludes all of my remarks. Are there any others from board members or questions on what I've reported? I just have a couple items. So on June 23rd, I did attend the City of Newark State of the City address. What's, well, I also had an opportunity to tour the brand new Dave Smith City Hall. It's gorgeous. But what's obvious and clear from the State of City address is that the City of Newark is still growing. Mayor Nagy highlighted the expansion of Lucid Motors and all the development in the Dumbarton, future Dumbarton Corridor and near the New Park Mall development in New Costco is going to be residential over retail. So I think there is a opportunity for the water district. I know we work closely with them in terms of water supply, water availability, but perhaps this is a good opportunity to make sure that they have the latest water conservation fixtures, uh, landscaping. I was actually thinking about metering. I know Director Wheat is really concerned about sub metering. So if we could take this as an opportunity when there's multi-unit homes, see if we could convince the developer in just in the design stage, see if it's possible to actually have individual meters because that actually will work towards our water conservation goals, right? Yeah. So just keep that in mind. That was actually what popped in my head when I was listening to him discussing new developments. And the second thing is yesterday, I actually sat in in the City of New York's Lindsay Track Public Workshop. I'm just going to say we have great staff. Our staffs are really well prepared. Thank you to Rekha and Litek. Litek did a really good job answering questions on the fly. So thank you very much. Director Gunther, any reports? That's nice. Director Akbari, any any reports from you or requests? Uh, no. Well, maybe just a quick a quick item. Um, I did attend the July Fourth parade, and then I was sharing with the uh, the Leica committee on Tuesday that some of the the comments that we received from members of the public were far more positive than uh, than previously. So I think our messaging is definitely getting out there. We we definitely heard from a lot of folks who, as we were passing by, were yelling out to us that they're doing their best to conserve water. And so we always appreciate that. Uh, but I was I, I just wanted to add that comment that I do think our messaging is reaching uh, members of our community. Actually, and, and our float was great, by the way. The attendance on that thing seemed to be up this year, too. Yeah, a lot of people. Thank you, uh, Director Akbari. So uh, at this point, if there are no further reports, 
we will move into closed session and I'm going to turn over um, these uh, items to our general counsel, Mr. Miyake. Great, thank you. It is now seven o'clock and the board is gonna convene into closed session for two items. Uh, the second item is item 8.2. And I just wanna note for the record that director Gunther will not participate in 8.2 because he has a conflict of interest. So the first closed session is item 8.1 pursuant to California government code section 54956.9 subsection D4, conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation, initiation of litigation, one potential case. And the second item is 8.2 pursuant to California government code section 54956.9 subsection D2, conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation, one potential case. And we can now convene into closed session. For closed door sessions, we will report back uh, in the in the boardroom. <clears throat> so. Uh, we're back from closed door session, and I'm going to have uh, our general counsel read us uh, what occurred during the closed door session. Great, thank you. So it's now 8.56 and we're back from closed session. Board convening closed session for two items. Item 8.1, pursuant to California government code section 54956.9 subsection D4. Conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, initiation of litigation, one potential case, and no action was taken in that closed session. Second closed session was item 8.2. And as a reminder, Director Gunther did not participate in that closed session. He left the meeting due to a conflict of interest. And that closed session was pursuant to California Government Code Section 54956.9, subsection D2, conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation, one potential case, and no action was taken in that closed session. And that concludes the reports. <clears throat> Are there any other issues that need to be brought up by either staff or a board member? Nothing from Hearing staff. None. We will close the meeting at 8.55 p.m.